Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I want to share with you a visual critical thinking tool that I've been working on um, with a number of the product teams that I work with over the last year. And to illustrate the tool, I'm going to share with you a story that I think is going to resonate with many of you. So back in 2008, I was a product manager uh, for a startup in the San Francisco Bay Area that operated online communities for university alumni associations. Now, it's, brought to my, it's been brought to my attention here in Britain that uh, Americans have a really odd affinity with our universities that's not shared around the world. So to give you some context, I want you to think about how you feel about your football club. That's kind of how we feel about our universities. So we operated communities for alumni associations to bring their alumni network together. And like many product teams, we had some pretty tough challenges to address. Um, whenever we would launch a new community, we would get a rush of traffic as people got really excited to check out their new site. But over time, that, that traffic would dwindle to a predictable trickle. I'm sure many of you have engagement challenges with your products, right? So our user research told us that alumni loved turning to their communities for help. They would ask for advice on everything from how to find their next job to what neighborhood they should live in in their new city. And this was exactly the type of engagement we were looking for. There was only one problem. We had alumni living in Dallas, receiving emails about bikes for sale in Chicago, or houses for rent in Boston, or internships in San Francisco. We were effectively making it easy for people to spam their entire alumni network. And we knew that if we wanted to increase engagement, we had to reduce the number of unwanted emails that were people were receiving. Now, if you're like me, you're already starting to think about how to solve this problem, right? But when I turned to my team and I said, let's brainstorm, I got a surprising response. One of our engineers, this guy Seth, jumped in right away and said, I know, let's integrate Google Maps. And I was kind of confused. I said, OK, tell me more. And he said, we can integrate a map that shows where alumni live around the world. OK, this idea came out of left field for me. I was scratching my head trying to figure out, <laughs> how does this solve our spam problem? And Seth said, oh, it doesn't. But it will drive engagement because it's cool. <laughs> OK, so I cringed a little bit. Uh, and I turned to the rest of my team, hoping they would help. And unfortunately, they agreed with Seth. They thought Google Maps would be cool and that we should do it. Now, at the time, I didn't really have the words to express my frustration. I, but I knew intuitively that building cool stuff wasn't good enough. And for me, knowing where alumni lived didn't feel like a big enough pain point. And integrating Google Maps felt like a gimmick. Now, this isn't a story about I'm right and Seth's wrong. You're going to see in a few minutes it's a lot more complex than that. It's the story of me as a product manager wanting to include the rest of my team in our decisions about what to build next, but not knowing how to do so in an effective way. And here's the thing. Today, I work as a discovery coach, and I work with dozens of teams, and I see this problem play out time and time again. We're not very good at going from a big desired outcome, like increase engagement, to delivering solutions that effectively drive that number. So I started to deconstruct this problem, and here's what I found. We tend to fall in love with our ideas. Um, and when we fall in love with our here's the thing. It's, it's easy for us to generate ideas. We hear about a problem, we immediately think of a solution. It's almost automatic. And because that loop, that, that closing that feedback loop feels so good, we tend to fall in love with that idea. And when we fall in love with our ideas, we don't pause and reflect. We don't ask, is this idea any good? And the challenge with this is when we fall in love with our ideas, we don't consider enough ideas. Um, and here's the thing. We don't, when we don't consider enough ideas, we, here's what we know from brainstorming research. If we don't, the more ideas we consider, the better ideas we get to. But here's an even more important distinction. 
When we consider one idea at a time, we tend to ask whether or not questions. And instead, what we want to do is we want to ask a compare and contrast question. When we ask a whether or not question, we're asking, is this idea good or not? Here's the challenge. This is a really hard question to answer. It's treating good as an absolute trait. Is our idea good or not? That's hard. Instead, what we want to do is ask a compare and contrast question, right? Of these ideas, which looks most promising? This treats good as the relative trait that it is. It's much easier to answer. So let me illustrate this for you. This is a photo of Usain Bolt. If you were watching him run around a track and he was by himself, and you were asked, is he fast? It's hard to answer. Fast relative to what? But as soon as you put other runners on that track, <laughs> this is a real photo of him running on the start, by the way. This guy is insanely fast, right? This is a relative question. This is a compare and contrast question. Is Usain Bolt fast? So when we consider more ideas, we, we make better decisions. But not only did my team fall in love with our first idea and not consider enough other ideas, we also didn't align around a target opportunity. Seth's Google Maps idea drove me nuts, not because I thought it was a bad idea, but because I thought it was irrelevant. It wasn't solving the problem that I wanted to solve. But here's the thing. I didn't take the time to make sure that my team was aligned around the problem that I wanted to solve. And so as a result, Seth was focused on our goal, increasing engagement, but he wasn't focused on reducing spam, the opportunity that I wanted to go after. Now, we're getting better at this. This idea of the problem space versus the solution space is becoming a lot more common in our vernacular. But even when we take the time to align our target opportunity, we also don't consider enough opportunities. I came into that brainstorming session convinced that the most important opportunity was reducing spam. Seth came into that brainstorming session convinced that we should help alumni figure out where other people live. Both of us were thinking about this as a whether or not decision. Instead of asking which of these ideas is the best, we started asking, is this opportunity worth pursuing? So I started to ask, how do we, how do we solve these problems? I see these problems not just on my team, but on team after team. These are easy, critical thinking mistakes to make. So here's the deal. I want to introduce you to this guy, Anders Ericsson. He wrote the book, Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. So here's what Ericsson did. He spent his whole life looking at what's the difference between experts and novices. And one of the key differences he found was that experts have more sophisticated mental representations than novices. So that's a mouthful. We're going to break that down. He defines a mental representation as a pre-existing pattern of information that we hold in our long-term memory that helps us respond quickly and efficiently in different, uh, quickly, quickly and effectively in different situations. Okay, awesome. I would love to have good pre-existing patterns of information that help us do this. And he says the key benefit here is it helps us understand the inf deal with information. It helps us understand and interpret it. It helps us hold it in memory. It helps us organize and analyze it so that we can make better de decisions. So if I were to look back at what happened in that brainstorming room, I came into that meeting having just completed a series of alumni interviews. I knew a lot about our customer needs. That was my pre-existing information. Seth came into that meeting having just read about new technology. He had just read about the Google Maps API. He had a different set of pre-existing information. And we were both using our different expertise to make fast decisions. But as good product teams, we want to make fast decisions based on our combined knowledge. Right? It's not just about our users. It's about what can technology can do and what will help our business. So I started to ask, is there a way that a product team could develop a shared mental representation of all the knowledge they're learning that would help them make fast product decisions? And this is what led to what I call the opportunity solution tree. Now, this, this depiction of it looks really simple, 
Uh, but I'm gonna use my story to illustrate some of the complexity with this tool. So first, it starts with um, increasing engagement, like starts with defining a clear desired outcome. My team had a clear desired outcome. We were all aligned that we needed to fix our engagement problem. But we saw that this wasn't enough. We didn't agree on how to get there. And we started by jumping right into solutions. But the problem with jumping to solutions is we don't know what problem we're solving. We know what, what our business problem is. We need to increase engagement. But we don't know what customer problems that if we solved them would increase engagement. And here's the thing. I don't want a product team to sit in a room and just think about opportunities. Our opportunity should emerge from our generative research. So it should emerge from customer interviews, customer observations. And to make sure we stay user-centered, I like to encourage the teams that I work with to frame an opportunity as something a customer would actually say. Now here's the good news about my story. My team had done a bunch of user research. We knew a lot about what alumni needed, and we easily could have generated a long list of opportunities. We knew that they, needed, they were getting way too much email. That's what led to the spam problem. We knew they wanted advice from alumni near them about where to live in their new city. We knew they needed help finding jobs. We knew they wanted to give back to the community. So if we get, if, for those of you that use opportunity backlogs, this looks familiar. What do we do now? Most of us would start prioritizing this list. But it's hard to prioritize an aspirational opportunity, like I want to give back to my community, with a specific opportunity, like I need to hire a recent grad. It's hard to prioritize a list of unlike items. Here's the other problem. This list, the items aren't distinct from each other. So saying I want to mentor a student is a way of giving back to the community. So when I compare those two things, it's almost like I'm comparing apples to fruit. It just doesn't make sense, right? So this is where the tree can help. So here's what I did. There's a lot of little text here. I'm, don't feel like you have to read all of it. I'm going to walk you through it. I started by grouping the opportunities that seemed similar. And I ended up with three distinct groups. One is people said I need help. And I'm looking for my, to my community. Another is I want to feel connected to my school. And another is I want to give back to the community. Now what's great about this is instead of trying to prioritize the whole list, we can prioritize the three groups. And I can tell you overwhelmingly what we heard from our research was that alumni asked for help. They turned to their community when they needed help with something. Now this is interesting because look at where my opportunity that I was fixated on lives. It lives over here on the right hand side around um, I get too much email. It was tied to this idea of I want to give back, but I'm overwhelmed with requests. It wasn't on this left-hand side where we were hearing most of the need. And look at where Seth's idea is. Seth's idea actually lives in this leftmost branch. And in this leftmost branch is exactly where we're hearing most of the need. So just by mapping out the opportunities, we're starting to see maybe I'm wrong and Seth was right. Now, here's what I would have argued back in 2008. I would have said, yes, I agree, this leftmost branch is where we should be working. But in order to help someone, we need to connect them with people who can help. And if we're overwhelming people with email, nobody's going to offer help. So I would have argued this opportunity on the right is connected to the opportunity on the left. Now, this is a mistake I see product teams make all the time. They focus on too many opportunities at the same time and they build really shallow products. They build a little bit to address a lot of problems, but they don't solve a single problem entirely. So if my assessment is right that these opportunities are intrinsically linked, the structure isn't helping me make a good decision. So I want to try again. So I went back to the drawing board and I said, how do I represent this complexity? And I rearranged these opportunities. And here's what I did. I merged my left branch and my right branch together. I want to bring my two sides of the marketplace, people who can help with people who can offer help, closer together. Because I want to build a deep solution that solves a real need. You can see here that the leftmost branch says, I want to connect with other alumni. And below that is different ways that I want to connect. I want to connect professionally. I want to connect with people near me. I don't know who I want to connect with, but I want to connect. 
Now what this does is it's starting to minimize the differences between my idea and Seth's idea. Instead of arguing about whose idea is best, we're starting to argue about which customer needs are most important. And this is a better discussion to have because we can use research to answer that question. We can start to say, do most alumni know who they want to connect with and then it's people near them and we just need to help them answer that question? Or do they have no idea and we need to solve the this opportunity around who should I help with. Now, a lot of us are overwhelmed with solution ideas, right? We have giant backlogs, we have these huge prioritization problems. And if we were to map those solutions to the needs that we're seeing, we would see solutions all the way across our tree. This to me is the definition of a shallow product. It's a lot of solutions that are addressing lots of opportunities, but most likely we're doing too much. We're not solving any of these opportunities well. So what I like to get teams to do is you, to use the structure of the tree to prioritize the opportunity space. So I don't want to prioritize in the solution space. I want to ask which of these needs is most important. What's going to drive our metric? So I can go row by row. I can start with these first two opportunities and say what's most important to the customer, connecting with other alumni or feeling connected to the school? And we can say we definitely think it's feeling connected to alumni. And then we can go to the next row. We can prune that rightmost branch and go to the next row and say, of these children, which is most important? And we can keep doing that until we get to a target opportunity. Now, here's the benefit of doing that. We can generate a lot of solutions for that one opportunity. This is where we're going to start to get the benefit of brainstorming, right? We brainstorm to get past that first or second opportunity. Because those are the, or, or solution, those are the, those are the first obvious ideas. What we want to do is we want to get to that seventh, eighth, ninth, twelfth idea that's really getting to innovative solutions. But if we brainstorm across our entire tree, we're not getting to that seventh or eighth idea. We're getting a lot of first ideas. And here's, and again, when we brainstorm 12 ideas around the same opportunity, not only are we getting the creative benefit of brainstorming, we're also setting up a really good compare and contrast decision. We have 12 ideas to compare and contrast. We're not saying is our idea good or not. We're saying of these ideas, which looks best. So let me give you some tactics for how to go from a list of a lot of ideas to some ideas to which idea to build. So the first thing we wanted to do to go from a lot to some, we're going to use dot voting. So dot voting is a really quick and easy way to get everybody on your team to, have, to voice an opinion. And here's why we want to do this. We know from research that groups are better at evaluating ideas than individuals. So don't send your product manager a way to prioritize this list. Do it as a cross-functional team. Now I don't want you to dot vote to get to one idea. Because when we only have one idea and we start to experiment, our experiments are asking, is this idea good or not? Here's the challenge with that. You're late in your discovery process. Your engineers are waiting to build something. What if you learn your idea is not good? Now you have to start over. You don't have time. Your engineers are sitting there doing nothing, right? If we ask a compare and contrast question of these ideas, which looks best, now we always have something to build. And we're making a better decision. What I love about this tree structure is it visualizes what you're considering. So if you're only considering one idea, it's visibly apparent to everybody. So it's easy to say make a compare and contrast decision. It's hard to remember to do it because we fall in love with our ideas. Whereas if we visually externalize what we're learning, what we're considering, it's a lot easier for the team to catch, hey, we're making a whether or not decision. What other options should we consider? So the first thing is to dot vote to get from lots to some. The second step is we're going to experiment to go from some to one. Now this is, again, it's Usain Bolt running around a track with other runners. I want to run three experiments to test these three ideas. Now if your idea of experimenting is to build the feature and A-B test it, I just tripled the amount of work you have to do. So we're not going to do that. When I talk about experimenting, I want you to identify the underlying assumption, the riskiest assumption that needs to be true for that solution to work. 
And then you're going to test that. So if we have three ideas here, which we're not going to have time to get into the details here, but that's OK. Uh, we're going to look at what's something we can do in one week's time to evaluate each of these ideas. And we're going to collect that data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, of these three ideas, based on the data we're collecting, which looks best? It's a really good compare and contrast question. So this visual is going to help you at all three levels. Are you considering enough opportunities? Are you comparing and contrasting opportunities? Are you considering enough solutions? Are you comparing and contrasting solutions? Are you running experiments that help you choose so you're not stuck with a bad idea that you have to move forward with because your engineers have to build something? So here's my goal. I'm hoping that this story has helped you enough to think about, I want to go make my own opportunity solution tree. But just in case it hasn't, I want to tell you a little bit about what other teams are getting from this tool. So I told you a story about my past. It was hypothetical of using this tree. And the reason why I used a past story is most teams' trees are proprietary. It's what they're learning from their customer research. So I can't share one of my clients' trees with you. But I can tell you over the last year and a quarter, dozens of teams are using these trees. Some of them are in the audience. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and here's what they're getting from using this tool. First of all, it's helping them avoid opinion battles. Instead of talking about my idea versus your idea, we're moving the conversation to the opportunity space. Which of these needs is most important? It's helping us frame our decisions as compare and contrast and not as whether or not. Because it's visually apparent when we're only considering one item. It's helping us as a team align around a shared understanding. In that brainstorming session, it felt like Seth and I were miles apart. But if we started to map out the opportunity space, we would realize that we were closer together than we thought. We both wanted to help alumni connect with each other. We just weren't sure what was the best way to do it. And finally, it helps teams communicate to their leaders how they're going to reach their desired outcome. And this is critical because most of us aren't just trusted to reach our goal, right? We have a boss that says, how are you going to do it? And we don't know. We have to experiment our way there. So that we can replace our certain roadmaps with features and dates with the opportunity solution tree that says, these are the opportunities I'm hearing about. These are the solutions I'm, I'm considering. These are the experiments that I'm running. I don't know the answer, but I have all these paths to explore. OK, so if this sounds like some of the benefits that you could benefit from, let's talk about how to build your first tree. It starts with a clear desired outcome. You can't get to where you're going without knowing what that outcome is. Next, you can map out the opportunity space. This is the hardest part. The structure of your opportunities has the biggest impact on, what you're, on how you frame the problem. We all, we've all heard how you frame the problem influences what types of solutions we can build. Play with that structure. Try more than one way. It will open up more possibilities. Third, choose a target opportunity by prioritizing row by row. Use the structure of your tree to frame your decisions. Limit your idea generation to that one opportunity. Don't generate lots of first ideas. Get to that seventh, eighth, ninth idea. And finally, use your experiments to choose between your ideas. OK, I have a favor to ask you guys. If you decide you want to play with this tool, please tell me about it. This is a new tool. This is my product. Send me an email. Tweet at me. And then for those of you that want to learn more about any of these ideas, you want to know about that research that I referenced, I put together some resources for you uh, so you can dive in to learn more about it. All right, thank you, guys.